Shalom and welcome to Lesson 9 of the Gospel According to Moses. This is Reverend Ferret again. And we'll be getting into the lesson here very quickly. A couple of things that I do want to bring up before we get in to lesson is the first thing I want to do is thank you. Uh, those of you that made such generous donations to Light of Menorah recently, some of you donated online at the website and some of you actually sent in donations and the donations have been uh, we're just so thankful uh for your support financial support for light of menorah nobody gets paid in light of menorah i do not receive a salary as the teacher in light of menorah so your donations are 100%. They go directly to the ministry itself and the ministry work. So I wanted to thank you so much. Those of you that would like to support us and continue to help us uh, go on, because we only, really, I, our, our existence is dependent totally on your donations and your support. We have no... Uh, other organizations that come in to support us uh, and other churches or Christian ministries and so on. So it's really you guys, those of you that are accessing the podcast and being part of the classes that we teach. Anyway, you can go to the website, www.lightofmenorah.org, Light of Menorah, all one word, no spaces. Menorah, again, is spelled M-E-N-O-R-A-H. M-E-N-O-R-A-H, lightofmenorah.org. And over there on the right side, when you come to the website, you'll see a place for donations. And if you don't want to donate on site, you'll see the address there for Light of Menorah in our post office box, and you can send donations there. Uh, second thing that I want to bring up is that uh, you are called, and I am called, all of us, as Christians to be disciples of Adonai Yeshua, Jesus and uh, we're also called to make disciples. So in terms of the work, we've talked about this in just recent lessons of the gospel according to Mo Moses, the work that was established in Genesis 2-3 that was still yet to be done, your work and my work, the things we're supposed to accomplish in the kingdom. I just hope that these lessons, the gospel according to Moses, uh, truth nuggets, those of you that may have not heard the truth nuggets yet, they're available at the website, or if you're following us on iTunes, or on Podbean, or on uh, iHeartRadio, I just hope that these are useful for your work in terms of going to make disciples, helping a new believer become a disciple, and remember uh, also don't forget our Facebook page as well that might be useful to you uh, for getting connected with people so that indeed uh, the lessons that I'm bringing to you uh, could uh, be shared with uh, many other people as you go to make disciples. So let's get into lesson nine. And in lesson nine, I've got a couple of things to take a look at. One is, it just so happens that there is a Hebrew word used for cows and goats and pigs and seals and whales and sharks. And that Hebrew word for cows and goats and lions and tigers and bears and seals and whales is the same Hebrew word that's used for man, nefesh. Living creatures is how it's translated in English. Are we the same? A cow is a nefesh and you're a nefesh. A pig is a nefesh. And I'm a nefesh. And it's interesting because the word nefesh is used as soul. Does that mean a goat, a pig, a whale, a shark has a soul? Interesting. We'll be taking a look at that in the Hebrew. Also, we'll be talking about, in chapter 9, a polemic again. And indeed, how God uses the Torah to help his people who have just come out of Egypt. Remember, that's one of the goals of this class, 
to understand how God tried to help his people who just came out of Egypt to get Egypt out of them, to have them turn and see that the gods of Egypt, the mythology of Egypt was totally false. So a polemic is a truth claim of our God, the only God, versus the truth claims of Egypt and how God wants to actually come against that. So for instance, we have to deal with something uh, that the Hebrews knew, and that was the god Pata, one of the great gods of the old kingdom. And Pata, the creator god, was called the potter. He formed everything like a potter would form clay to make a pot. Now, isn't that interesting? Because the god of Abraham, the god of Isaac, the god of Jacob, the god of Israel, the god of the Bible, our god, the only god, he's called a potter and we're called the clay. Wait a minute. So our God is being connected to Pata? Very interesting. Now, how does our God, the only God, the true God, come against Pata? So we'll take a look at that here in Lesson 9. So you ready? Ready to go forward and go deeper into his word? As we continue on in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, we have to take a look at verses in 1 and 2 again. So get your sword of the spirit, get your Bible, get your water bottle, get your hiking shoes. We're ready to go. Are you ready? This is the way. Jesus is the way. Let's go. Woman is made, and just as a an aside, I'm not trying to go into everything <laughs> in the Torah. We can't. Otherwise, we'll be here not till 2027. We'll probably be here to 2097. And I don't know who's going to take over for me after I go to the Lord. Maybe one of you guys will have to, and I'll give you my notes. Um, so we can't do everything. But I want to I focus in on those things that jump out at us, that jumped out at me, um, that disturbed me. Because I don't want to be alone in being disturbed. Okay? So I'd like to have a group of people also disturbed with me. So, in Genesis 2-7, we find out uh, another thing in here. It says God formed man, but also in Genesis 2-19, God formed animals. It's the same Hebrew word. However, whoever was the writer did something that nobody notices. This is fascinating. The word formed in Genesis 2-7 is the Hebrew word yatser. Yatser. The Hebrew word in verse 19 of chapter 2 is also yatser. Hmm. The word, though, in verse 7 is spelled with two yods at the beginning. The word in 19 is spelled with one yod. If you don't study the Hebrew, you will not catch it. Something's different. And the writer is trying to tell you that something is different. This is fascinating. One explanation is, Man has a double nature. Animals have a single nature. Is that why the two yods are there? We don't know. That's an opinion. That's a view. All right? The Bible doesn't say. It's fascinating, though, that when you go to the Masoretic text and you go to the original writing, as far back as we can go, Yatser in verse 7 has two yods. So it's yod, yod, um, Yod, Yod, Sadi, Resh. And in 19, it's one Yod. Yod, um, Sadi, Resh. Fascinating. Now, man and animals are different, and we know one thing that happens that is just amazingly different, and that is God blows breath, Neshama, into the man. He does not do that for animals. Are you with me? They're formed from dirt. So it's as if God formed both of them this living beings, from dirt. But only one does he do this something different. Because we know he breathes into the man, right? The Ruach. Fascinating. So mankind is special. Now, 
again, remember, we're dealing with, we're trying to deal with the Hebrew text from the Mazoric text. And for instance, the Chumash has it. JPS Torah Commentary has it. Some of your translations that are in Hebrew will not have it. So you've got to have a credible scholarly source to actually take a look at that. Now, with regards to John Kareed, and he wrote a book called Against the Gods, and he talks about that in many cases, God used the Torah, not just Exodus, but the whole Torah, all five books, as a polemic against Egypt. Now remember polemic? Polemic means uh, a story, uh, uh, a point of view, uh, a description that is anti another one, completely opposite. Okay? So an example is this. If you're a Hebrew, you're coming out of Egypt, huh? and as you're coming out of Egypt, we've already talked about this, I think, in Lesson 1, that it is quite clear that they really bought into the wrong story. They were worshiping the gods of Egypt. They probably, for the most part, forgot the god of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. At any rate, they probably knew a lot of the creation stories. So in Against the Gods, we start learning about the creation stories of the Egyptians. One of them, for instance, let me just quote here from page 38. Ra, however, is not the only god portrayed as a creator in ancient Egypt. So Ra, Amun-Ra, he's a creator god. But when you take a look at the history of ancient Egypt, which is 4,000 years long, they had various leading gods be creators. So they had various creation accounts. Uh, a lot of them had very common elements to them. So he said, for example, in the Memphite theology, depicts Pata as a potter creating the universe. In another text, in the great hymn to Kanum, the god Kanum is pictured as forming everything. Listen to this. Forms everything. Man, gods, land animals, plants, everything on the potter's wheel. The word yatser is the Hebrew word used for what a potter does to clay. Whoa. Now, if you're a Hebrew and you're hearing this, they're saying, wait a minute. This God, the God of the Bible, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, is not patah. He's not kunum. Kunum formed everything on the potter's wheel. Our God, yeah, he formed man, yatser, like a potter. He formed animals, yes, like a potter. But what did he do to man that was different? Breathed life into him, not the animal. Something's different. Something is spectacularly different, this unique situation. So for them, they could see that this is a polemic quite definitely, especially using the word yatser. So, our God in the Bible, he made man and animal. And he did it basically the same. He used yatser. He formed like a, like, like a potter. Kunum, he did the same thing, but he did everything. All gods, plants, fish, everything. Insects, everything that's created, he did on his potter wheel. Galaxies, stars, okay, everything's on his potter wheel. But, for us, God's cosmos plants animals. God has a very special and unique thing that he does. He breathed the breath of life into man, only him. And on top of that, nobody gets authority and control over the cosmos. Nobody but man. It's in the first Torah commandment. You will fill the earth, right? And you will have authority over the fish of the, everything. This is mankind. This is not animals. And definitely, this is not in the Egypt, Egyptian creation uh, uh, account. In the Egyptian creation accounts, man has never given that whatsoever. They don't have authority over anything. And we remember this. We're created in the image of God. Man is supposed to act like God. And on top of that, what did we just read in Genesis 2-3? Which makes a lot of sense. It seems as if the actual Hebrew says, and God stopped 
creating the work that was still to be done. That's what the Hebrew says. You'll have a different translation, but you've got to go to the Hebrew, and yet when you actually go into the Hebrew and you study what Hebrew scholars are looking at, they have been debating this for almost 2,000 years, longer than that even. And like I said, the Orthodox are about the first guys that came along that with a very good view of that and said, no, mankind is a many given work to do. And then we read the very words of Jesus. Wow, this is amazing. So there is a creation. We are created, man is created, man and woman are created to do something above and beyond. Now, woman's created, right? Was she created before sin or after sin? Please remember this, okay? Woman was created before sin, okay? So we read this in Genesis 2, 18 through 22. By the way, this is very interesting, ladies. You're going to love this. It takes one verse to create man. And it takes six verses to build a woman. He didn't form her. He built her. It's like taking a, an erector set and putting all the things together. He built her, not formed her. Adam is a bunch of mud. Okay, she is built, boy. Whew! Some of the guys, <laughs> thank you, you're laughing, and I have a woman laughing. Thank you so much. Anyway, so we're looking at verses uh, 18 through 22. Now, Yahweh, God said, it is not good for the human to be alone. I will make him a helper corresponding to him. So Yahweh, God, formed from the soil every living thing of the field and every fowl of the heavens and brought each to the human to see what he would call it. And whatever the human called it as a living thing, that became its name etc etc we finally get to verse 22 and god built there's the word that's an actual translation of the hebrew built the side the rib if you would that he had taken from the human into a woman and brought her to the human brought her to adam now the hebrew there for you've heard this a suitable helper my guess is those words were done by male translators after the fall. Because it says, Azer, Azer, Keneged. Azer, strength, power, help. And Keneged, the Hebrew word there, is used many times in the Talmud, many times in Jewish commentary as equality. This is a power equal to man. Amen. Not a suitable helper. By the way, when does woman when does woman finally have to be subject to man? After the sin. She caused it. Women's livers. They caused it. You will be subject to your husband. That happens later. But the ideal condition, you guys is men and women are equal. And there is a power. I have to say this, that I know as I try to move forward in this work called Light of Menorah and teach, I can't, I can't even begin to tell you what an equal helper my wife is. She's sitting back there by the sound booth. She knows that sound booth. She, she wouldn't say I'm an expert. But she wanted to get trained, and we thank her for getting the trained and the other things that she does. This ministry does not go unless she is working, period. This is not about me. She says, go in the Israel Roman study, but make sure you go off her bike ride later. And then she takes care of the rest. So indeed, when we take a look at this, my wife, your wife, a woman is not my butler. She's not my maid, she's not my secretary, and she's not my servant. She is equal to me. I find that fascinating because I think what had happened is, after the fall, because us guys are physically stronger than the woman, okay, and we can put her down physically, I think that 
had a lot to do, in my own mind, this, I just, that's just my opinion. And I think that's where a lot of the male dominance actually happens. The dominance is going to be because physically we're stronger. But when you come to the realization, because I sense a strength in my wife that I cannot attain. There is a power in her as a woman that I could never attain. Why? Because she's a woman. She's separate. She's holy. She's kadosh. She's the in the image of God. Amazing stuff. So, by the way, this... I got to read this statement because I just, I couldn't believe this. Let me see if I can find it. Yeah. This is in the JPS Torah commentary. And let me see if I, I get, here it is. Listen to this. In the JPS Torah commentary, talking about Azer Kanegid. The scholars say, curiously, or Sarna says, curiously, the extent literature, in other words, all of the literature, of the ancient Near East has preserved no other account of the creation of the first woman. The Bible is unique. There is no other creation account that talks about a woman being created. Amazing. And on top of that, she's not created, she's built. Quite amazing. So, we have the original plan. Man and woman are created equal. They're both in God's image. And we go back to Genesis 2, verse 3. And God stopped creating the work that was still to be done. Is this work just for man? Just for the guys? Are you kidding? God never said that. This is work made for his creation, Adam and Eve. It's created for both of them. And in Genesis 2.24, we come to the fact that he's joined to his wife. If you read it, there's no such thing in here in Genesis chapter 2 on polygamy. It doesn't say, and God, or a man, will leave his mother and father and be joined to his wives. What's the perfect model that God established? Right here. He will be joined to his wife. And what does Jesus say? Right from the beginning, this is the way it should be. One man, one woman. Without reading chapter 3, I want to stop and get, get into it right away. There's a couple of things I really want to accomplish with this. Maybe we'll have to finish the rest of it next week. i got about 10 minutes. Just some comments on the fall. The uh, various translations that you have talk about a serpent. And the Hebrew word there is nakash. Nakash is the Hebrew word predominantly used for snake. All right? Normally used for snake. Now what I want to do here is I'm going to stop here for a second. Why a snake? Isn't this interesting? Why a snake? Why not a frog? Or how about, oh, I don't know, a hippopotamus? Or a dragonfly? Dragonfly. Ooh. Why a snake? Now, all of you who are afraid of snakes and they're so icky and. Okay. Why? I mean, he could have picked anything, but he has snake. Could it be there's a polemic? Oh, ho, 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 ho. wait a minute. They're coming out of Egypt, yes? yes. They know the Egyptian gods. Yes. And God is trying to help them see that the gods of Egypt are false gods. On top of that, in Deuteronomy, I can't remember what chapter, you can look it up. 
that God is basically saying, when you worship those gods in Egypt, you were worshiping demons. Wow. So with regards to this, the Hebrews are coming out of there, and probably for the most part, the greater majority of those people are probably very integrated into the mythology and religion of ancient Egypt. There was a god in ancient Egypt. I'm going to give you two names for him, because if you Google it, you'll come up with the other name. So I'll give you both names. One of them is Apep, A-P-E-P. Dr. Pepper, a pep, you know, it just reminds me of a Dr. Pepper, so a pep, A-P-E-P. -E the other one for the same God is Apophis, A-P-O-P-H-I-S. That's probably the Greek, Apophis. Now, this God is the, the epitome of everything that's evil. He is the most evil, horrible God. In all of Egypt, he is the enemy of Amun-Ra. Now, Amun-Ra, every day, remember, pictured by the sun, he's going to be in a bark, a boat. Okay, that's what they called him in Egypt. And he's going to go around the universe, all right? And at sunup, Amun-Ra rises, and now it's daytime, yes. He's in his bark as he continues to travel, and then he goes into darkness, Okay, when it gets dark, and then he's traveling in the darkness on his bark. What Apophis is trying to do is to get that bark. In one account I read, it's to try to, to, to beach it so that he could kill Amun-Ra. Apophis wants to bring chaos back. Now remember, in the Egyptian creation accounts, what we're dealing with is Amun-Ra came out of chaos on a ben-ben. The word ben-ben, okay, is the, in quotes, Egyptian for this mound of earth that comes out of the primordial waters, the chaos, the darkness, okay? They're shaped like pyramids. And Amun-Ra creates himself on top of a pyramid, on top of a ben-ben, okay? And he starts bringing order out of chaos. Apophis is his enemy and wants to bring chaos back. Like I said, he's referred to as the evil one. On top of that, another thing he wants to do is he wants to kill and destroy the Egyptian tree of life. And Apophis was pictured as a snake in the 18th dynasty. Awesome. Just awesome. If you're a Hebrew and you see the snake in the garden, what is the snake trying to do? Trying to come against, and certainly from their view, if they understand Apophis or Apep, okay, the Hebrews would say, look what that snake is doing. We know who that is. He's in, he's in paradise. The tree of life is there too. He's going to destroy it all. He's going to destroy, bring everything back to chaos. He's going to try to destroy the, what God created. And it doesn't happen. You see, Amun-Ra is in fear of Apophis. Ra. That's the enemy. Ra has an enemy. Does our God have any, any enemies? Does he have any enemies? No! There is no enemies of God. Oh, there are people who hate God. There are people who don't believe God. But is there anybody that can destroy God? No. Anybody that can defeat him? Are you kidding? In the Egyptian mythology, Apophis could destroy and come against Amun-Ra and bring chaos, unless he was defeated. And by the way, the good news is, if you look this up, he was killed near the Tree of Life. Just wanted to let you know. So this is interesting because the God of the Bible, he's got no threat. And this is what you read in Genesis chapter 2 or Ge Genesis chapter 3 when you're dealing with the fall. Our God has no enemies. Our God has no threats. And it's done in a polemic. Now, is that the only reason why a snake is chosen? I don't know. 
But when you actually understand the Hebrew culture and you understand what was happening 3,000 some years ago when they first read this, it is quite likely that they see this as a polemic against Egypt. For us, fascinatingly enough, when we understand this, it brings us all the way up to the present. And you have to really challenge yourself to say, is there anybody on the face of the earth that's a threat to God? No one. I never saw this before until I studied it from a polemic point of view. It really made so much sense. Was Jesus defeated at the cross? No. no. It was his victory. Amazing. Our God definitely has no threats and no enemies. He is God over all nature, all time. He's not even part of time. He's outside of time. Though he makes a piece of time, kadosh. And he gives it to us and gives us new work to do. So that ends Lesson 9, and I am constantly amazed to see how the Torah and the things that God inspired Moses to write to his people, how it serves so many a variety of purposes. As a Bible historian, I look upon those first five books, realizing when they're written, and the time period, and who the audience was, and to realize that God's Bible was written to them 3,500 years ago, not to us. And when we understand how they understood God's Word, it helps us apply God's Word in a deeper and more richer way in our own lives. And that's why the polemic against Pata. The polemic against the idea of God, gods, the gods having enemies. Our God has no enemy. Just, just amazing how God uses this as a polemic against Egypt for his people to completely come against the religion, the philosophy, and the truth claims of Egypt that his people had assimilated into. Well, we're about going to Lesson 10. And in Lesson 10... We're going to uh, see that God said to Adam and Eve, hey, you can eat everything, go ahead, all the trees, all the fruit, everything, but there's one tree you cannot eat from. And with regards to that tree, if you eat from that tree, on that day you will die. That's exactly what it says, and we'll be looking at that in Lesson 10. The problem is, did God lie? Because Adam and Eve, they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and they didn't die. Matter of fact, Adam lived 930 years. What's going on here? Very interesting perspective we have to take a look at. We'll also take a look at Genesis chapter 3, the fall of man, the sin in the garden, and so on. We're going to continue to see how this is not only a polemic against Egypt, wait till you see that, but it's also a picture of the gospel, the good news that God has for fallen man. We will see how it testifies of Jesus. And we'll remember in Luke 24, 50, that Jesus lifted up his hands to bless his 120 disciples before he ascended the Father, just like the high priest daily lifts up his hands. It could very well be that Jesus blessed them with the ironic blessing. I've taken the ironic blessing and I've turned it into a prayer. I'd like to end our session with that blessing. That blessing that's based upon the high priestly blessing that God gave to Moses to Aaron to bless the people. Yevarekeinu Adonai Vishmarkenu, Yair Adonai Panava Alenu, Vekunakenu, Isa Adonai Panava Lenu, Viasem Lanu Shalom, Vishem Yeshua Adonenu, Amen. So together, let's say this in English. May the Lord bless us and keep us. May the Lord make his face 
to shine upon us and be gracious to us. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon us and may he give us his shalom. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.